Welcome to our Waterloo Smarter Health Seminar. I'm Shirley Fenton, Managing Director of the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. Thank you for joining us today for this seminar celebrating the University of Waterloo's 50th anniversary. I'd like to welcome our web viewers and the Ontario Telehealth Network sites. I think we have 20 tele telehealth network sites, OTN sites today, so this is marvelous. We just really appreciate uh, all of you joining us today. This seminar is being recorded and is being web uh, broadcast over the web. We ask that you hold your questions to the end of the seminar presentation so that we can get a real or virtual mic to you. A very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Octo Barnett. We're so pleased that you and Sarah made the journey from Boston to visit us today. David Johnson will uh, in introduce you more formally in a few minutes. Uh, a special thank you to our seminar sponsor, Ontario MD. Ontario MD is a subsidiary of the Ontario Medical Association and uh, receives funding from our Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Ontario MD was established to support physicians in Ontario with the adoption of information technology and to help them implement the efficiencies in their practice and deliver improved patient care through the use of information technology. Brian and Wing C uh, is here today. Maybe you can just both stand up and let people know who you are. We're very grateful for your support. Thank you so much. As well, a, a, a thank you to our series uh, sponsors, Borden Lander Gervais, McKesson, Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada, and Smart Systems for Health Agency. I just have one announcement. We will not have seminars in July and August, and we'll resume this series in, in September, on Wednesday, September 26th. We are so honored to have Michael Kirby, who, as many of you know, is just recently retired from our Senate. Mr. Kirby chaired the committee which studied the state of the healthcare system in Canada and produced the report entitled, The Health of Canadians, The Federal Role. It will be a great seminar, so I hope to see you all in September. This series celebrates the 50th anniversary of the University of Waterloo. The anniversary theme is, why not? These seminars are dedicated to this theme and will explore different why not questions related to health informatics ideas and innovations. So the agenda for us today is David Johnson, President of the University of Waterloo, will introduce our speaker. Dr. Octa Barnett will speak for about 45 or 50 minutes. And at that time, we invite all of you to ask your questions and engage in a, a very inter interesting uh, dialogue. So please signal when you have a question and wait until we can get the microphone to you. Please position the mic towards you when you speak and we invite everyone to ask your question or comments. I will now turn this over to David. Shirley, thank you very much. What a delight it is to welcome Dr. Barnett and his wife Sarah here. First, just another comment on uh, why not and the theme for the 50th anniversary year of the University of Waterloo. The line comes from one of George Bernard Shaw's plays. I take a little bit of liberty with the actual quote, but the way I present it is a couplet that says, some people see things as they are and wonder why. We dream of things that ought to be and ask why not. It's a wonderful statement. The first statement can apply to virtually any university, uh, the constant inquiry, the relentless pursuit of knowledge. But I especially love the second statement, we dream that's future looking of things that ought to be the moral imperative and ask why not that sense of can do and get on with it. And what a wonderful topic, why not address clinician knowledge management needs? And what better person to do it than Dr. Octo Barnett? We we're just comparing notes. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in northern Ontario and he grew up in the south and we we're kind of out shuffling one another as to whether he owned shoes when he went to Harvard in 1952 whether I had shared a pair with my brother or not, etc. But uh, imagine a career that goes back to 1952, um, currently as professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School and senior scientific director, laboratory at computer science, the Massachusetts General Hospital. Imagine the connections to the health establishment, uh, to Harvard and to MIT and technology and applying technology to, to health today in this wonderful span of years uh, to do it. So many wonderful memories come back to me as I was chatting with Dr. Burnett. I had the, the great good fortune to study as an undergraduate student at Harvard and then 
I think I've filled virtually every volunteer alumni role that one can hold, including a, a wonderful term as chair of the Board of Overseers. Only Harvard would use a term like overseers and class marshals to designate those people who raise large sums of money uh, from uh, their classmates, and I'm proud to be both of uh, those. Um, our number three daughter, uh, who is a, a young professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa, did her undergraduate degree at Harvard and got started on a career in law and medicine. She's now a family physician two days a week, and three days a week she's a, a, a researcher and just received a, a grant uh, yesterday, we learned, of $250,000 over six months uh, for the beginning of a study of, uh, of the mo most effective primary integrated care practices in Ontario. There are different models for different situations. And of course, health informatics will be a very large part of that particular study. So we're very proud of, of her. She's expecting twins almost any day. So this has been a wonderful week for our family. And our number five daughter, who has a learning disability, and Dr. Barnett has dealt with dyslexia, uh, is doing her PhD at Harvard on how the mind learns. So she's taken her problem and turned it into her opportunity and her life's work. And her master's thesis was uh, using the software with one of her remarkable professors at the Ed School has developed to teach uh, reading, especially to adult illiterates. And they assess the strong and weakest learning tool through software of the illiterates to then be able to de develop the base from which they can teach them to read and other learning skills. So we owe an enormous amount in our family to your wonderful university, Dr. Barnett. In fact, I serve on the Smart Systems for Health Agency here in Ontario now, and my interest in that kind of thing was kindled by George Wald, one of your colleagues uh, who won a Nobel Prize uh, for uh, the chemistry of vision. and. Uh, taught a thousand undergraduates, uh, non-science majors, basic science, because he was determined that we non-science majors would not leave that institution without knowing a little bit of science. And the only reason there are only a thousand students in the class is that was the largest classroom, that's all it could hold. And it kindled the interest of so many of us who went into law, business, or other careers in science and stayed with us. And now to our speaker. Uh, you have in front of you, I think, the information that describes the vital statistics about Dr. Barnett. I'm not going to take any more of his time by going through them. I just want to say how absolutely thrilled we are to have you here, how much we look forward to your talk today and your continuing uh, direction of this fascinating world of health informatics. Dr. Barnett, please. Thank you very much. It's always good to be introduced by another country boy. <laughs> uh, I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you, and I, uh, uh, I do say I, I'm delighted. I think the volume is a little bit high. Everybody's got the fingers in their ears. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they may say that way. Uh, I, I got another degree here from Harvard Business School. I, I think that's, a, that's an adequate recognition of my talent that the med school doesn't recognize me. But that, that is actually the med school. The business school is the one across the river. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to try to do today is uh, tell you first the things I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to tell you very much at all about medical records and electronic medical records. Uh, I will say it's because we have a long tradition. That's the uh, record of patient number one at the National Hospital in 1821. I'd say that was before Canada was settled, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, there were Indians here. I should have, I should have, our First Nation were here at the time. Uh, and that, that's a, it's a, in those days, uh, the record of a patient was kept in a one paragraph on a page, and that was the total record of the patient. So that's actually a book of two years of the patients uh, at MGH. I'm not going to talk about medical record systems. Now, in some of the manifestation that Dominic passed out, he talked about that I might be, you know, talking about decision process. Uh, it's true I am a country doctor, but and that's sort of how I think about things. But uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about either. And that's Bay theorem, in case any of you have a problem with it. Uh, I will talk a little bit about computer activities, and that, that's sort of where I started with the information. I think it's by Newman, somewhere in the early 40s, I believe. That uh, basically that was one of the earliest sort of moving slides back and forth. I'm not going to be talking much about computers either. Uh, well, uh, I will be talking about basically uh, how you sort of make decisions and 
and once you go into it, and so this will sort of be the theme of, of, of where I will be talking about. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes about this, where's the knowledge we have lost information, where's the wisdom we have lost in knowledge, from T.S. Eliot. Uh, and I sort of break that apart and say, well, where's the knowledge we've lost in information? This is the type of information issues that we have to deal with in the practice of medicine. And that's a list that goes on and on and on and on. And given that, then I say, well, where's the wisdom we need to have to deal with those? And these are sort of the ways and the things of, of enormous list of different type of resources that we have to deal with in terms of extracting the wisdom to deal with these type of informations. So what I'm basically going to be trying to talk about is to deal with the system that we have developed at MGH that basically tries to provide uh, support to the primary care physician in terms of information, knowledge, and patient education. Uh, it is not an electronic medical record system. It is, in, in terms of a push-pull, it primarily is all completely a push. The, the providers seek information in terms of this. It's a collaborative effort between the Mass General Hospital Primary Care Unit and a laboratory computer science. It's extensively used, uh, 3,000 sessions each week, over 10,000 registered users in the past four years of partners. Uh, it's, a, it's a very active system. Uh, I basically argue very strongly that we need to focus on what's called just-in-time clinical knowledge and very much focus on trying to respond to a specific problem at a specific time in the right place. And that we're not talking about a theoretical type of decision need or a theoretical type of knowledge access. We're talking about something that a physician has a patient with a specific problem, how to respond to those type of needs. And now I'll just show you just a few examples. By the way, I don't keep time very well. What time that's it? It's 3.15 now, so I should be through by 5.30. It's okay. <laughs> uh, should I have a PSA test on a 50-year-old male with no urinary symptoms? Here's a real question that comes up in patient care. What does a physician, how does a physician respond to that? What should they do? Now, what I'm going to show you is basically a, this is the first screen of a very uh, extensive knowledge base. And what this is, it characterizes, let's, do I have a pointer? All right. All right, well, I'll just talk about them. Uh, over in the far left is a series of resources that you can click and go to. This is what we were talking about. This is a series of type of resources you can go to. Uh, administrative resources, educational resources, electronic medical record. We have two medical record systems at the MGH, go to these or different site information about the site. Uh, and these are different classes of information we have. Primary care guidelines, that's one of our most important parts. These are the guidelines that basically we have written. These have all been written and generated by physician staff at the MGH. Uh, these are individuals who are highly motivated and highly knowledgeable about what the problems really are, and then will really try to, to get the uh, evidence to support what the recommendation should be. Uh, they are attempts to be attempted to encapsulate in a fairly short page, two pages, exactly what the recommendations are. I'll show you those a fair bit more. Second is patient information. We are very much concerned about giving the patient the same type of information in written form that they would get from the physician at the time of the visit. And it sort of reinforces what the physician is saying and gives the patient a piece of paper that they walk out with that gives the same sort of instructions that we'd like them to have. Next is basically drug information. In the United States, we have a peculiar type of, of activity, uh, such as how you turn this on. Do I shine it yet? Hello. And then what do I do? <laughs> This high Canadian technology. Don't shine in my face. Ah, what did you do? You have to kind of wiggle your finger. Have to what? Wiggle your finger. <laughs> <laughs> Say, <laughs> if, if somebody show me how to wiggle a finger, I, I don't, it's not a, Ah, all right, very good. Drug information. We have enormous problems in the United States of a variety of different insurance coverage that 
that have a, a, each a variety of different drugs that they, that they give or, or, or cover. And basically, I illustrate that a bunch. That is one of the most troublesome things about dealing with formularies in the United States is the fact that it's not just one coverage. Uh, things like how do you find a pharmacy, uh, what insurance has what formulary. Another unsung issue, uh, in a hospital like MGH, and imagine in most hospitals, tremendous amount of forms that one has to have to fill out. And you know, you have a drawer for you try to pull out where's the latest of this form or where's the latest of that form. This type of information, having them all online available to be printed out immediately, is a great time. Medical calculators, uh, I'll show you some of those. These are the standard type things. Everything most popular one is a basic medical calculator for how much you should weigh. Uh, clinical access guide tells you a whole lot more information about ASAP. And patient letters. This is integrated in with our medical record system so that when you get the lab test back, uh, you can click on patient letter because it will automatically generate a letter that contains the laboratory test values and also paragraphs that have been written to interpret those types of things. And there's a, uh, we try very hard to keep an up-to-date list of the latest things you should know about, practice alerts that have come in in the last week, and that is updated almost daily. And then what's new in the, in the, uh, in the site, this is a new practice alert, here's a, a new type of what's new on there. These are new guidelines. Uh, this was put in specifically for me. My elbow was giving me trouble. Uh, and various things about other types of activities. This list is continually updated, so you can keep track sort of what's going on in terms of the knowledge access activity. Well, let's go to the patient guidelines. These are, this is the subset of the headers of the patient guidelines. There's probably about, uh, I think about, oh, what looks about 50 subset, total subsets, and there are about almost 1,000 guidelines on the system. And so, for instance, if you go to the, the, the prostate cancer, who is written by, what time is written by, uh, and then you'll get this as your guidelines. And basically, it gives the specific recommendations. It tries to be very specific, very brief, very much to the point. In other words, this is, this is clearly what the guidelines say. Uh, gives a background of it. Now, for each guideline, you have references. We'll show you what they are. We also show you what the, the impressions are, what the recommendations, what the references is, and what a patient brochure is on this. So for each of these problems, you get basically the information that you need to have about that. Here, for instance, it gives the background, the references. It gives the recommendations that are made by other groups about PSA screening, so that you may not like sort of what MGH is saying, but here are the other groups that have made recommendations about PSA. Here's sort of our impression of what the summary of the recommendation should be. This is sort of the bottom line message. And then basically it talks a little bit more about this uh, and what the different references are mean there. Uh, you also give the references for where we made, the, how we derived this recommendation. For any one of these, these basically you can click the message and it will take you basically to PubMed and show you the uh, reference for that. Now, what we do with this is, you sort of look at it, this is a portal that opens up to a very wide spectrum of medical knowledge and medical information resources. And we try as much as we can to organize it in a way, make it very easy to come by. Well, let's say, is the patient information available? You decide you want, you want to give information to the patient about this. Uh, basically, you could either click on that top slide I said about patient information. You can go to the issue on patient information. Here's all the categories of patient information, about which is about 800 of these. All of these written by our own faculty at Harvard, and all of which are integrated or represented or consistent with what was the information we gave the physician. So this information that we give the patient is what the physician is same information is dealing with. Uh, and so as you went to that, you would tell about basically the PSA test, uh, where, why it's important to have, gives a background of the patient, information about it. It gives examples of why you might choose to have it, why you might not choose to have it. It tries to give the, 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 the patient a, a sense of what's going on here in terms of whether to have that. Uh, you can now another question. If patient information available on calcium supplements for women. What I'm doing is just rambling through the database to give you some examples 
of the type of activities of what it does. For instance, now you go back to patient information and you'll find a calcium supplements for women. And here basically it talks about calcium so why you might do it. Uh, here you can basically, any of these you can pick out and get a printed form of it. Uh, at how much and what to give. And then we'll give you, you could give to the patient, here's the different parts of the food that you might use to get the calcium from and how much. So what we try to do is, is to really make available to both the physician and the patient as rich a resource of knowledge and information that is possible in order to basically, we think, make patient care on better decisions and help the patients to better understand why the decisions were made and what's the meaning of them. Well, now I get to another whole area. It has to do with the, the, probably one of the most troublesome things in the practice of medicine in the States in terms of formulary is let's say you wanted to give, you want to know is this particular drug covered by free care? Now, free care happens to be a type of insurance that patients with a low income where the cost is reimbursed by MGH and partly by the state. And only certain drugs are covered by free state. So basically, we go to the insurer's drug formulary. The insurer's drug formulary, we basically go then to, we go free care, we, we identify up here the patients on free care. Now, the information you get back depends very much on which ones of these you pick. Each information from now on is a function of the insurance that the patient has. Okay, now we go basically, here's the drug that we want to find out about. We go to that, and now we get basically a drug of that. We get how much it costs, average doses. Uh, but now we also say, here's an alert that came out from the FDA about that. And also, we can click up here. These are different resources on our site that have to do about that drug. So if you want to read more information, basically you can read about that, or you can read about the uh, FDA alert for that. This, for instance, is the one from FDA about what is the information, current information, about the basically possible side effects of using this drug. It probably will be changed. That, that will be even, well, there's a lot of argument about the validity of this, so I won't go into, into the argument of the validity. Uh, now, the other thing we do, again, looking at this as a portal, we don't try to maintain all the laboratory, all the medication information. We link to an on-site, which we lease from Lexicon, about every drug. And so we can click right there and go directly through our portal to the Lexicon, learning about that. And basically, for instance, one of the things it gives is the different uh, known interactions between that drug and these here. The lexicon is a, is a very rich repository of this type of information. We don't try to, they update it very regularly. We don't try to reproduce anything we can buy. Uh, now, the other thing we do is for each drug, we try to have basically access to information about that drug to give the patient. And we can basically get information here with a, uh, I click that. That's good to the English, or we can click the Spanish version of it, and we get the Spanish version of the drug information to give the patient. We're trying to, to give this information available in as much, many different languages. We have some of our clinics in, in Boston have a, at least seven different languages that are spoken by patients in there, and the whole problem of translating, when we spend a fair amount of time in translating into other languages, and also we write it in what's called they don't call it common English. There's some other word for it. This, this, this is written, we think, for English for about somewhere between the 8th to the 10th grade. We try to write English for the 4th grade. So we, we'll write it, well, dumbed down is not the right word for it, but use it very simplified in terms of the words and the vocabulary for those type of situations. Well, then we have a whole other thing about what to do. And, and so we have here a, a repository of what's been added to the site. And for instance, here it says, well, there's been new information guidelines on HIV screening that basically just announced by the Public Health Service. So we, we basically announce on our site that, hey, we've got something new here. 
Because what are the problems here? This site is enormous. And to try to keep track of what's on the site and what's available has been a continuing challenge. One of the things we have done is basically every time anything new is added, we'll keep for about two weeks on the site that something new has been added if they want to look at it. And then this basically is the HIV guidelines about this. Again, it, it has information about everything. We, we go to that. We also can give background. We can give that impression. What, what's our recommendation? What's the general recommendations? And what references for it? So everything that we sort of announce like this, we try to give justification for why it has been written this way, why the recommendation has been made that way. Now here's the patient information then. Again, patient information about HIV screening, about that. In other words, this, this type of information we find is enormously appreciated by the patients and is enormously appreciated by the physicians. I think one might hazard a guess that the physician now does not think they have to spend quite as much time going over the details of the advice to the patient because they know they're being given a sheet of paper that has the type of advice on it that they might want to have. Uh, we do know that these patient information sheets are some of the most heavily used resources of the system. Well, now there's a whole other thing. Remember I said there's forms of all type. How would you get apply patient to receive a disabled plate form. That's a typical example of a form. Well, so we go to useful forms. Here are a whole variety of the type of useful forms we have on here. And they're, they're, you know, a useful form for doctor's order, a useful form basically for premarital medical certificate, uh, hypertension, you perform. These are the type forms that occupy a, a full drawer of a desk as you're trying to keep track of all of them. And if you click on the form, for that, you basically get this, and you can click on that, and it'll print it out. And you can print it out, fill it out, and send it to the state registry. Again, what we're doing is this, we, we, we say we're dealing in a very, very rich knowledge and information environment, where a physician comes into it, and my goodness gracious, the amount of knowledge that they're supposed to know, the amount of knowledge about medicine they're supposed to know, the amount of knowledge about what the hospital does, about what the procedures are, about how to get the drugs, this is an enormously complicated world for a primary care physician to live in. And our major purpose here is both to sort of improve medical care, but also make life easier. I sort of, my, my view in life is to make life easier for the primary care physician and to give better care to the patients they take care of. And so this, this is not what I would call science of any sense of hard science. This is, this is using a computer for what you can really use a computer for, is to help you do your daily work. Now, this is the type of, uh, oh, oh, this is a, the type of calculations. Uh, the system has about 10 or 15 different uh, forms that you fill out. And this is very good with the basic calculate your 10-year risk of a heart attack. Uh, physicians like this very much for a couple of reasons. If say, let's say you, you type it in and you say a smoker, you'll get out a calculated 10-year risk. And now you say to the patient, well, see, what would happen if you stop smoking? And so you change this to a no, and you get a very different calculated 10-year license, 10-year. That type of implement, that type of, of diagrammatic sort of presentation, the doctors, a number of doctors feel that's a very useful way to try to deal with the issue of smoking which is certainly a major problem in a, in a significant part of our population. Well, one of the things I talk about, how do you find all the things? Well, we have up here at the top something called, back, uh, uh, this is a search bar at the top. And what we have done is you can buy from Google their little machine that you put in your own lab that is a complete Google box, but you search all your own pages only. And so all of our, oh, several thousand pages are searched by Google. And so if you say, okay, what do you have on back pain? These are the different ref references you have, basically. Introductory document to low back pain, 10 things for memory and management, referral guideline, who, who basically and when should you refer them to a rheumatologist or emergency ward? Uh, what's a conservative treatment guideline reference? Uh, more of those. Acute laid back pathway, there's a pathway to how to handle it. 
So anything that we have in the site about Lopaxane, this brings up and makes readily available to try to access. It also, there's basically, there's a button up here called feedback. You press that, you basically get a form. And basically you fill out as to things that you want to suggest the site should do. That is an extraordinarily useful resource for us. And I'll show you some of the comments we get back because this keeps involving the users into what their site is and what their site should have. We try very hard to make this a user-friendly and a user-owned site. In other words, this is not us telling you what to do. This is you decide for yourself what it is you want to have. Here's some of the feedback requests that we've gotten. And I just took a sample, four or five of them that just came in recently. Uh, would you consider entering by burn care? You know, I would not have thought of putting this on a site, but on the patient, uh, sunburn, first or second degree, uh, when to see a doctor, uh, the, any chance of having a national provider identifier directly online. We're now in the States developing a, a national provider guideline. They want us to put that online for them. They learn have handles on lateral medial epicondylitis. Anything that works for guidelines on HIV, human papillomavirus vaccine. Would you consider a patient to hand out the herpes zoster? I suggest they to hand out specific to et cetera, et cetera. These are real requests from real people dealing with real problems. And this, we, this drives us very much. We probably create probably average between two and three guidelines a week responding to these type of questions or modifications of guidelines. Uh, now, basically, this again says, you know, what, what is sort of updated materials? We send out every week an email to all of our users saying what is new on the system. And this, again, is a very useful way to They're used to getting each week an email from us saying what we've done new about the system. And this way keeps them sort of knowledgeable and aware in some sense committed to the system as an access for them. Well, this is just some of the highlights. Uh, as of the last count we have as active users, we have 9,200 active users of this system. In MGH, 5,000 no more in MGH, 58%. 11% of all the users are, pre are primary care providers. We get an enormous amount of use in terms of users, people use it, that are not just primary care providers. And here basically only 462 of the primary care providers or from MGH. These other 500 providers, uh, the, the partners network has about 10 or 12 hospitals scattered across eastern Massachusetts and about 1,000 physicians who are more or less related to the MGH, part of the MGH network. They turn out to be, although we only announce it, we only send mail out, we only sort of respond, our leadership comes from MGH, we find a, a growing amount of usage from areas outside MGH, part of partners, but basically have not been sort of told about it or solicited by it. Well, this just gives you basically uh, the type of user type. In other words, that we, that we had 2,000 nurses, 1,200 people identified themselves as specialists, 900 as, as physicians, what, 890 as residents, and the employees on and on and on down. Uh, dietitians, physician assistants, uh, medical assistant, medical student, clinical support staff, a whole variety of people using this system as a knowledge base, as a knowledge base, as a management access device. This tells you basically about the number of the different sites within partners. Just giving you a list of some of those sites. Now, with MGH is clearly tops with 5,000. Peter Webb Begum Hospital, we've never done any publicity over there, never introduced it to them, never asked them to join the committee. Uh, we still have basically, what, almost 2,000 users from the Brigham who, who, who use this site because it's available to them. Uh, and it goes on down. In other words, these are some of the different hospitals. Uh, oh, the North Shore, Newton Wellesley, uh, probably, I don't know where that community else is. Spalding is a rehab. Faulkner is a hospital that we own. Charles Love Medical Associates is a non-MGH affiliated. Uh, Cambridge Somerville Hospital, Emerson, PHO, Melrose Wakefield. These are all hospitals 
that basically sign on to use the system. They have to be part of partners access, but they again that they've done we've done nothing to try to recruit them. Uh, we're never quite sure whether we should or not. Uh, we're sort of overwhelmed or, or committed to the MGH as a primary source of funding, as a primary source of content. And we, we, really, we don't go out and seek new hospitals. Uh, it may well be that we should, but without the resources, we just haven't done that. Uh, okay, well this, wait, I must have backed up on that. Well, this is about the use of PCO over time. Uh, this is uses per quarter, starting back in 01, so up to 06. This is the usage increase per quarter, and so it's gone up now to a little over 5,000. So this is what's happened to the usage of it over the last six years. So that to me is a very impressive representation of the fact that we must be doing something close to being right. This is sort of the number of Hanmold users, and again, this is not that much different from what we had. I'll skip that one over. Uh, in the past six months, 98% of the primary care users at MGH have used the system. Uh, in the past two months, 94% have used it. So we get fairly heavy penetration of our primary care users. They basically, they look at this bit. Now, what we did each year, we send out a survey. Uh, it's a paper-based survey, although we also send it electronically. We send it to the 215 MGH primary care physicians. We get responses from 77%. I'll challenge any of y'all to send out a paper-based survey and get a 77% return to. That, I, I would say, is almost one of the most uh, drastic types of, of challenges, I can say, and also one of the most rewarding. That, yeah, they, they must really, they must respond to it. Uh, this says, basically, of the what percentage of patients in your practice do you access PCOI in a typical patient care sense? And we find basically 40% of the physicians say over 50% of the time of patient visits they access PCOI. So clearly they are using this in the patient care. Another 30% in 26 to 49%. And that has been increasing each year of the number of patients they access the system in. Well, this is the rating. We say on a one to five scale, one's not useful and five is very useful. We now have 68% give it a five. Our average rating is about 4.7 on a one to five scale that PCY is useful. So they clearly do, they clearly respond that it certainly is very useful. Are useful? Are, uh, this is just useful for the guidelines. They feel the guidelines, 43% give it a five, rating for the guidelines. Uh, this is again just how useful it is in your patient care. We are asking questions in different ways, seeing if we get different answers. Fairly consistent with that. Now here's 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 the end point. This is a point that makes it all possible. How many minutes did the website save in your typical day? Uh, this is save time of busy practitioners in a very busy environment. And note, 41 percent say it saves over 25 minutes a day in their practice. That, I will say, when I show this to the hospital administration, there's never a question at all about funding. I mean, this clearly, because you can sort of work this out a bit. If, you, if that actually is true, and given the number of physicians, and another 15 to 24, say 29 percent, it represents about, you're saving, three to four physicians full time with this site. Well, considering a full time physician might cost the hospital something like, I say, 200000 That means it's close to a million dollars being saved each year by this program. Now, that's, you know, that's a lot of flimsy uh, type of, of assumptions being made in such a calculation. But that is, I think, one of the more impressive data we have on it. And here, basically, this is a number of minutes saved in your typical day. I just want to show what happened, 204, 205. Uh, you know, I, I, I really think that your laser is weak. I, I, yours is better. <laughs> All right, I give up. Okay, look at, two, look at 205, look at 205, 206. Basically, each year, 
they basically are more and more are saying it's saving that much time in the time. So they, each year they are, they are saying it is more useful in terms of the activity they do. Well, now I'm just going to finish up just a little bit, show you these are the sort of a listing of the primary care guidelines and how many views they had. And what is that? That's for a three month period, January, or, no, a 15 month period. You know something? You, you point them to. <laughs> I'm looking the wrong end. <laughs> oh, right. All right. That just shows basically uh, aging, I mean, influenza, exclusion of uh, these are the, These are the guidelines, the most popular. That was, we had 2,000 views of the guideline that we had about bird flu. We went through a period where bird flu was clearly a, a very uh, uh, high thing. I mean, evaluation of abnormal vaginal bleeding. Uh, there, of course, the spider veins, screening and treatment of osteoporosis, uh, management of abnormal cervical cytology. Uh, these are enormously number of guidelines that basically are being looked at and used by these, these physicians. Let's see, where's my time? Uh, these are the patient information sheets. And, you know, uh, portion control and, mind, and mindful energy. Well, that's, you know, all of us are overweight, so that's, that's a sheet that certainly gets printed out a fair amount. Uh, relaxation response, warts, uh, birth control pills, how to use them, lifestyle change of the upper control blood pressure, high potassium foods, how to use a new food guard, fiber content of foods, monitoring your own blood pressure. These are, again, probably one of the three to 400 type of uh, patient information sheets we have and sort of the number of times they were used over a 15-month period. So if you look, in other words, uh, uh, the TLC diet to prevent and treat height is 2242 in a 15-month period. That's uh, over 130, 150 times per month that was printed out. Well, these are basically the suggestions we've had of topics for new guidelines. These are what patients would like to have, and that we're beginning to work on. As I say, this we've got a long list of different things to work on. Everything: acne, orgaris, COPD, headache. Now, I'm sure we have something on headache. I don't sure why they they suggested that. Management of BPH. We have something on that too. They will often ask for things that are in the site already, and that's something that continually haunts us, is how do we let them know everything that's on the site? We can open it, hey, just type it in the search bar. Why don't you try something very unusual and type in the search bar? And you'd get immediately linked to this. But this is what they say, osteoarthritis, vertigo, vitamin B12 deficiency, etc. These are what our users will say they want to have done. This was taken probably, of, that was, I imagine, about two years ago when I did that survey. A lot of those certainly have been put in there since then. But these are the things that, these are the questions that come up in primary care. Now, one of the things we're trying to do is basically link in with a medical record system. And when a physician orders uh, Avidon, basically, it will come up back, it comes up from the PCOI, that line. In other words, it links in, it sends it to PCY and say, do you got anything on this that we should know about? And it also then shows, of this class of drugs, these are other three drugs that have similar type effects and make to that. So what we're trying to do is, in the environment of a working EMR, find a way that we can link in to information that is in the PCY and make it available. Again, Almost all of our work is on the, is on the pool list. We don't push this at them. We do a little bit here that we show them this, but, but we don't say, hey, you've got to go read this. But we very much try to make it as easy as possible for them to go after it. We found that to interrupt a physician in a busy practice of medicine, unless they want to know it, it will irritate the heck out of them. And you, just, you, can't, you can't just say, hey, wait a minute. Stop this. I've got something I want you to know about. And if that, if that, what you want to do is read two pages of a document, you're going to be in real trouble. And so you've got to find a way to, to take small bits of it around 
and then get them really to know what's there and to use it more and more on a voluntary basis. And that's very fundamental to the philosophy that we have in how we develop this type of system and how we try to make it available to them. And then, for instance, if they have basically, uh, they, they were going to recommend a, a course uh, on, a, on cancer screening. See the little question about, put, go to the left just a second. That little thing right there. Well, that means they can get a video on a DVD that will tell the patient about all the processes known and how to work up, they have, what they're going to have to go through to have a colonoscopy and what, why you should do it and what are the risk factors. And if you press the one to the left of there, that right there will bring up basically the information we have in the PCOI about screening for colorectal cancer and the whole issue is about why you should do it and what. So what we're doing more and more is to try to find little ways that we can go into the EMR and place little buttons that they can access and go to to get further information about it. And that's sort of a key philosophy to what we have is how, how, to, how to integrate in the most effective and easy to use fashion of this tremendous knowledge base and the tremendous information base that they have to know how to use. Well, what factors do I think have contributed to success at NGH? We certainly have had strong continuing leadership from the clinical department, from the primary care department, the Department of Medicine, and from the hospital. From the very beginning, there's never been a question. This, this system came about, by the way, about six or seven years ago. The primary care department had become concerned that there was such a variety of patterns of care among the different primary care units. And so they got together and wrote guidelines, and they had a nice big white three-wing bound volume. And they said, look, we've got it. Now, after I quit laughing, uh, I said, look, you, you, you can't keep this updated. You won't know how to distribute it. After you distribute it, it'll just sit on the shelf. You've got to find a better way to make this information available. And so with only a modest amount of persuasion, I, I told them about web-based technology and the fact that you know, we could make this easily available. And the graduate came into this uh, about four years ago, and it's been basically a growing. They, they now swear by it. We have a, 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 a medical uh, advisory board of about 15 of the group leaders of the, different, of, of the different practices, and we meet once a month to review what the status is, what's new and different, what we should be doing different, what should be added. And we have a, a very real commitment to making this a user interaction, that this is your system, this is your system, and, and basically you need to take the leadership and you need to take the, the wisdom and experience you have to say how it goes. Well, the, as I say, there's a tremendous amount of personal contact. Uh, there are two of the programmers, the project manager and myself, go to each of these meetings. And there's a continuing flow of information, comments back and forth between us and the leaders of the different primary care units. We have a continuing promotion of it. I mean, every week they get an email from us. They've gone to use it. If we didn't send an email out, we'd get 10 emails back. What, what, what happened? I mean, they, it really is a way to keep reminding them of the information that's there and keep reminding them about once every two months we say, learn to use the search function. I mean, we, we continue to try to keep telling them how to do it. We also will go out and visit a number of the different sites that are using it and sort of give them a personal demonstration of it. Uh, again, this issue of feedback, continuing user interaction, that is absolutely critical for its success, its continuing evolution. And adding new material and updating the old. Updating the old is one of our, uh, one of our real problems. Some of this stuff was written now three or four years ago. We found it not that hard to get some of the really good experts to write something about something. It is very hard to go and say, hey, look, it's, this should be updated. We try to say everything on the site gets updated every year, and we don't achieve that. Uh, we think that's a legitimate and a, and a goal that we should do, uh, and we probably about 80% of the way updating every year, but that is, that is now, on the drug information, we are absolutely, we have now uh, basically partners that assigned two pharmacists that work basically 
they, they will keep track of every notice that comes from any insurance company and update our database and update any information they have about it. And if we hear, we continually hear from one of our pharmacists, well, you, you say free care doesn't cover this, well, we just found that it does cover it. So we send them back out to the pharmacy, they go through the thing, and we, we really, that is the one area uh, from a user perspective and a patient care perspective you've got to be right on. Because the difference in cost of a prescription that's covered by your insurance and a prescription that's not covered by insurance is between $20 and $200. And so you really want to take advantage of knowing what drugs can be covered by the insurance. And as of this, this issue about it is not just medical knowledge. It is a tremendous amount having to do with workflow support that is context knowledge about what in this environment is useful knowledge to have, what type of, of formula information, what type of patient instructions, what type of patient letters. This is not teaching the doctor something new. This is providing a type of a support capability so that life is easier for them. And basically, they don't have to spend quite as much time at night catching up with their homework. And lastly, the major challenge is increasing integration with EMR. That is no mean problem. Is that the way you say it? It's a hell of a mean problem. Why did I say no mean problem? You all figured that one out. Uh, and that type of area is clearly the direction we should be heading toward. Uh, and we should certainly be heading toward it in a way that has a little bit more of the push. If we see a doctor, we certainly do it with now with our screening measures and our preventive care. We will now wrap a few knuckles if they hadn't had a mammogram in last year, or if they hadn't had a, they hadn't got a pneumovax, or if they hadn't done this. We will we will certainly keep on them, but we need to do it more in terms of we do it a lot now in terms of diabetes. We really monitor what the hemoglobin A1C is, and if it's and we give them a graft of it, and the drugs that they're on, and we say, hey, uh, you really might consider sort of increasing your 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 degree of uh, of drug treatment you do of this. Uh, that is probably one of the ways to go in terms of that. Uh, the issue about electronic medical record is not an easy one. Electronic medical records, I hesitate to say, is one heck of a problem. And uh, we've been fairly successful over now about 30 years with the system that has evolved very much. It's now used heavily in a couple of our primary care units. Came out of the old history of CoStar, the Health Community Health Plan. Uh, and it is all web-based now. It's much more, much. It's much, it does say that we do a lot of, of activated big patient. I mean, we do a lot of work with that, uh, but it's still not by any means. And the issue about patient access, I think, is a legitimate question. Why shouldn't the patients have access to all this information? We are working that problem. I think we all agree that it's a good idea. We're still working on a way to identify who a patient of MGH is. I mean, we're a big institution with multiple clinics, and how do, we, how do we sign them up and say, okay, you're a patient and you get access to it? And that sort of technology is, is not, it's not heavyweight technology, but it's heavyweight in terms of implementation issues of how you achieve it. Uh, and then more guidelines. I, I thought at one time we could saturate, hey, one time we could really have, we'd cover everything. I, I have not seen a decrease in the number of requests for new guidelines over four years. So the, uh, medicine is a very complicated world, and there's a lot of new stuff that occurs. And keeping up the track with the latest stuff that they need to know is a continuing challenge and a continuing commitment that we have. Well, there we go. You do have Dutch elm disease. video and web conferences to ask questions. I will pass up. And uh, we uh, welcome those. And please, if you're online, uh, don't hesitate to get the questions in. I uh, would like to get the microphone to you for the people here in the audience. So if you have a question, please put your hand up as early as you can, and one of us will race in your direction. And uh, I just wanted to kick it off with a question. You really has shown an incredible effort here in, in content development. 
And I know people give you ideas, but how many people are involved behind the scenes in translating this stuff into the system? We have now. Uh, hello. Stand over there. You won't get feedback. Okay. Uh, we have uh, one senior medical editor who works about 20% of the time, 30%. We have two medical editors that work, uh, physicians that work about 20% of the time each. And we have one full-time uh, uh, non-physician uh, editor who uh, does a great job. I mean, see, much of this stuff you could find out there somewhere if you know where to look for it. And we'll take it, and we, we have no hesitation about extracting, modifying, and stealing. Uh, so that it's a, it is a, it is a continuing effort, and there, there are uh, two programmers and me. I don't know exactly what to call me, uh, working basically on the uh, medical side of the, the technical side of uh, supervision. It certainly, it, it is for me a personal pleasure. Really, have I had on a system that was liked, and you know, it really, it really is, it is a very rewarding system to say, you know, hey, I really do enjoy using that. Uh, I mean, that makes my day. Uh, now, there is a significant issue about, well, so big deal, you got it working at MGH. How about taking it somewhere else? Uh, I had a grant from the NLM about four years ago. That I said, look, MGH, you know, hey, anybody could make it work at MGH. How about going to the other end of the spectrum? And so I tried to find four of the most deprived areas in the country that might find something like this useful. One of them was a hospital of the Navajo Indian Reservation in Arizona. One was a small community hospital in northern Maine in a county that has the lowest per capita income of anywhere in Maine. And to have the lowest per capita income anywhere in Maine, you've got to be low. Uh, the third was basically the uh, hospital, National General Hospital in Nashville that was run by the Harry Medical School. And the fourth was a program run by a wonderful group of people called Boston Healthcare for Homeless, where we have about 30 caregivers who manage the care for the homeless of Boston, which are about 15,000 at any one time. Uh, it didn't work in three of those places, and for a number of reasons. One of which is I was taken in when I, I they said, I asked, you know, do you have the computer technology? Oh, yes, yes, we are, we're all set up for it. Uh, they didn't. It doesn't work if it doesn't have the computer right on the patient, on the physician desk. It, you can't walk down the hall and, and get it. They, they don't do that. They can't do that. They don't have time to do that. It also takes a degree of leadership that has the time and the wisdom and is a recognition to say, hey, let's make this work. Let's see what changes need to be done for our own environment. Let's go in and talk to people and tell them about it. You need that type of local leadership. You can't be given from outside. And the third is there's a fair bit of the content that has to be made specific. I mean, the drug formula, for instance, doesn't work in Maine. It works very well in Massachusetts. Uh, and so your whole issue about a formula, and we never could get, for instance, Meharry in, 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 uh, in uh, Nashville to find out even what formula they could use. Uh, and, and those type of issues are are striking. Uh, they are not that much concerned with the technology of this per se, but they are fundamental to making it work. Uh, and my idea now is that uh, I don't, I don't even conceive of trying to transfer it to sites that don't have a fair degree of local technology that is supported well and leadership that is committed to it. Uh, in that circumstance, I think it can. But it, these, this is not a this is not ready for mass production to the common ordinary hospital. Wing C, a question? Good afternoon. It's Wing C, Luck from Ontario MD. Um, I'm, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm encouraged to see uh, a lot of similarities between what you've been doing and the, what we're trying to do with Ontario MD. And one of the challenges that we faced is I see you focused very heavily on clinical practice guidelines, and that's certainly a demand that we hear from our physicians. I'm wondering if you can comment on the process by which you develop your clinical practice guidelines and how you get consensus in terms of the practices that are included, because that certainly 
a challenge that we faced in terms of we don't produce clinical guidelines on our own, but we receive um, many different kinds of clinical practice guidelines. And I'm curious your process on how you select which one you're going to follow. Well, basically, we select primarily from what the users suggest they think they want to have, at least the new ones. The old ones were sort of the standard set that a primary care unit might say, gee, we ought to have guidelines, but that would be only about 10% of what we now have. Uh, we look at guidelines from other areas, but we tend to be really very strongly focused on what do our own physicians want to have? What do they see? What works here? And uh, the guidelines all go through an elaborate screening process. We'll write up the first draft, and we have a steering committee. And we will take it to the steering committee, and they will comment and criticize it. And then the next draft, we send out on a, we have what we call a side site, a, a development site. We put it up there and say, hey, go look at it and tell us what it is. We then send it to the specialty unit that has sort of ownership of that particular area and ask them to comment on it. Now, oftentimes we disagree with the specialty unit. Orthopods think we mistreat back pain, that they all should be operated on at once. Uh, the, uh, the, the actual, I mean, we also will look very much at national guidelines and try to figure out, well, what are they saying? What's new and different? In other words, it's not a perfect system, but it works very hard at trying to reach openness and consensus. Uh, so that I, I think I'm, I think I would still do it that way, eating where I was. Octo, um, is there any way that people can access a, uh, a version of this or see how it works or do you have like a play system that you show to people or how does it work? Uh, I don't have a play system, but I can make available a password that uh, if we had someone other, I mean someone that knew what they were doing, uh, you know, a real doctor or something look at, uh, yes, we can make that accessible. I mean, we'd, we would we'd, we'd like a, a degree of, of, of understanding that they weren't to make it public and that they were looking at it, yes, we can do that. So we could arrange that? Yep. Okay. Derek? Thank you very much for the presentation as well. One of the things that I note is the definition of workflow seems to be the workflow uh, of the physician. Is there any uh, contemplated uses of this to drive the multi-party workflow where a particular diagnosis would mean that there's going to be lab tests or that there's going to be physiotherapy or what have you? and using this as a, a, a way to manage handing off work to a clinical care team. I, I, your point is very well taken. It is used to a certain extent because the physicians work usually in fairly close contact with, a, with, with supervisors who work there, but they're not, they're not independent decision makers of their own. Your point is well taken. I don't know that, I don't know that we have many, the one area is we have sites like that in or in our outlying clinics in the low-income areas, where we have a number of very active nurse clinicians. And there, we, it, primarily in the area of diabetes and hypertensive control, we work very closely with the team in terms of trying to help modify what it is and actually re developing a sort of outreach type program. Hey, this isn't happening. Uh, go out after these patients. Uh, but that's something I think as we learn more and more how to deliver care, we will certainly do that more. We are now, most of our work is acting in the classical model in which we now find ourselves, but we've got to change a lot of those habits, particularly in low-income areas. Uh, it works pretty well when you can sort of depend upon a patient to come in, but if you can't get the patient in, then there's a whole other necessary things or activities to deal with. Are there any the care guidelines, and I'm thinking specifically of something like capacity planning, where you could say, statistically, in a given year, we expect to have this many patients exhibiting these sorts of symptoms, and the guideline suggests that it would be, therefore, a load on lab for this and a load on something else for that. We, we certainly stay in the areas we get into, for instance, when, um, when the flu vaccine was limited in Mulder, and we, we worked very closely with administration in terms of how to access restricting it to the most vulnerable patients. And we will, we will do responses in that regard. In terms of, I think in terms of the mammography, we work with sort of the, 
what low t one of the problems with mammography we have is the patients can get their mammogram not only in the general, but they can get up in two or three or four outline areas and trying to figure out how we get information back from them, from these independent units. It, we haven't achieved that well yet. Question in the back there, Arthur? Hi. Uh, thanks for a very informative talk. I was wondering, how do you guys deal with uh, security in terms of accessing or even manipulating the information on the system? Or is this even a concern at a point? About this, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening too well. Um, uh, I was just wondering about, about the security of the system in terms of accessing or changing the information by outsiders. And is this even a concern at this point? I think there are three things that come to mind. One of which is the medical authors and the medical unit don't want to be perceived that we have now established truth. In other words, there's a sort of an arrogance that would sort of say, hey, this is MGH, but it's also what everybody should know about the tube. I mean, I don't know whether that's a real issue or not, but there is a sentence about that. The second one has to do that uh, I don't think we're prepared to respond if anybody had any specific questions, issues, or comments. Uh, we are, I mean, we're fairly limited in terms of our support staff. The third has to do with our legal department is uh, as long as we can make things educational and perceived as education, we have a complete rights to do it and make it available to everybody. But once it gets into something we're recommending a specific type of patient care decision process, that causes them to become very nervous. Uh, I, I don't know the validity of that nervousness, but I think there is some, some reason to be concerned about that. So, for example, in the patient guidelines, in the case of the patient guidelines, uh, which would in, uh, be an issue in care, that would be where they would be concerned? I think that's the principal reason to be concerned, yes. And uh, then, is there well, a the reason? Patient see, equally, equally well. Okay. Um, then, is there a security that protects that from being changed? I, I presume you have a, a barrier so that people can't just go in overnight. Oh yes, we're the only ones that can change that. It's run by the lab for computer science completely. Strictly that. Strictly that. I have one other question related to the adoption. And <coughs> did this really start? when they came out with that book, and that was the stimulus? Or was this thought about beforehand? No, it basically, the book came out, and I was, there was a bunch of my friends that were doing it. And uh, I, uh, that was when the web was becoming very clearly an easy way to program and an easy way to distribute. It's when we were getting terminals on all the doctor's desks. And so a lot of things seemed right to, to try a radical method of doing it. <laughs> One of the big issues we face in the country is physician adoption of systems. And it, uh, it seems that this has gone like wildfire. I mean, uh, in one set of institutions, a very rapid response. <coughs> and yeah. uh, obviously, they're finding it useful is one thing. And it, it must have had to grow, though, to a point where it became useful. And yet, it seemed to be almost a linear growth. Well, it did increase rapidly at one point. Well, Was there a point early at Early on, we started workflow support. I'm sorry? Early on, we started workflow support. Oh, okay. And that was what, and the formula issue was a real problem with those thin number of different uh, Medicaid formularies for the different insurance companies. Uh, that was a, a, a major, I mean, that, that, that was, they, I don't know how you could have operated. They, were, they would be in deep, deep trouble without that. So it's that basic, almost grinding, ordinary stuff that really seemed to turn them on, I mean, as a group. Well, it's what, what got it going. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll go over here. I, I, I have to look him in the eye to keep going. Right, uh, the, the formula issue at that time was, was in clear-cut chaos about what drugs to give or what insurance companies. Uh, that was certainly one area. The other area was patient instructions. Very early on, they really came to appreciate those patient instructions. Probably more than the guidelines, but the patient instructions, I mean, they really felt, well, I know how to take care of hypertension. I mean, they, really, they really look at the hypertension guidelines. They really, but they, they, uh, the, patient, the patient instructions 
and the formula issues were two of the early winners. You know, what interests me is that that very ordinary thing of forms <laughs> really had such an impact. And we've had the technology to deal with that for a long time. So, it's Well, we, hadn't had the, we didn't have the technology in terms of the, of the terminals on the doctor's desk. And we didn't have the technology of the very easy creation of stuff you can do with the web now. Okay. Uh, we, now can, we now can bring stuff up very rapidly. Got a question in the back here. Thank you. Um, have you seen any interest expressed in uh, what I would call uh, calculation routines? For example, with diagnostic tests. Uh, let's take PSA since you were talking about that. If the test result is below one in some units, and I can't remember, uh, then uh, typical result that might be returned by the lab is, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, no evidence of uh, prostate cancer. If it's uh, in the range from one to three or three to six or above six, there are different responses. Uh, another way to interpret those tests is by something called likelihood ratios and uh, pre and post test probabilities or odds in favor of disease or, or odds against uh, disease. Have you considered uh, calculation um, page which allows a physician to select a test to input a test result uh, perhaps also to give his own subjective probability or the prevalence you know there might you might give uh, on the page the current uh, estimate of prevalence and then allow the physician yeah, to get yeah. a post test I uh, know you're, you're way beyond the closest we come to that is where we use the explain link to the lab test Basically, we will now look at the value of the lab test in a, in a probability basis. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, we haven't done a lot for that. I have, I've wanted to do more in that regard, and I think I, I, I would love to find a way to get in touch with the commercial laboratory reporters and say, hey, we've got a system that would really enrich how you make reports back. Uh, and I think uh, we should do that. One of the problems has been vocabulary, and another problem has been what's a normal value, and we'd have to deal with both of those to, to do how to deal that well, if I understand what you're saying. Other questions? Here's one down here again. Take a second. We told him when we gave him the microphone that if he came out of the corner, we'd shock him, and we've so far resisted the temptation. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Barnett, I had another question regarding, um, I'm very impressed by how much time this site has saved physicians, uh, more than 25 minutes a day. Uh, but I, I heard you say that also there's so much information on this site. What was your strategy in getting, I, I understand the once the physician is on or the care provider is on, you, they receive emails from you so that they know. Wait, I'm going to have to turn this off and get closer because I okay. can't, I'm also there. <laughs> okay. So how, what was your strategy initially to get, because physicians are very busy, and so what was your strategy to get them onto the site and familiar with how to use it so that they could see the benefits of saving time? What did you do, site visits or tutorials, or what did you do? Site visits, getting three or four leaders. Just hold that up to your mouth. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Getting getting leaders in each of the getting leaders in each of the set. <laughs> uh, uh, getting getting leaders in each of the sites to sort of learn about it, know about it, making site visits to the sites, telling them about it. And in some sense, are getting it started. And once you get it started, encourage them to tell the peers about it. Most groups have a very strong peer relationships, and they will talk to each other quite a bit. Uh, and also being able to deliver something. In other words, it's not, just, it's not just paperwork. It's something this does help you. And so very early on, you want to be sure that you're actually doing something that they feel is valuable and perceive as valuable. Any final questions? Anything from online that we need to deal with? 
I'll make sure I don't forget. Octo, uh, I, we've arrived at the end. Uh, we enjoyed your escapades with the microphone and the pointer. This was the only entertainment we had today. Uh, I, I just I need to say a personal note. Of, first of all, uh, thank you and Sarah for coming. Uh, coming here is uh, a job all the time, and it's hot, hot out, and so on. We really appreciate your willingness to come and, and uh, the chances to meet with you today with a number of different people. Uh, this has been a great honor for us, and uh, uh, your presentation is extraordinarily interesting. I wasn't even aware of this work, uh, and what we'd like to do is let people know more about it. And this, this should be an opportunity in Ontario. Uh, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. And on further review, he may not really have green, uh, uh, Dutch elm disease. It's, it's hard to know at this point. Wait to take the microphone away from him. <laughs> well, I always have the pleasure of giving the gift to the speaker, so it is uh, a, a very heartfelt thank you oh my for being great. a speaker. And uh, so hopefully this will be a memento at the University of Waterloo. Oh, and uh, maybe we can get you to come back again. So, oh, uh, absolutely, Sarah. absolutely. So anyway, thank you once again, and I just remind you to come back and see us in September uh, when uh, uh, the Honorable Michael Kirby will be here. It will be a great uh, start to our fall session, so please come back and have a great summer. Thank you.